You are probably most famous for advocating the use of kettlebells. Why is that? I think they're pound for pound the best piece of equipment money can buy. When it comes to the world of strength and conditioning, you know, you'll tell me it's a bike. But um, <laughs> pound for pound, I think they're the best piece of equipment money can buy. You can do more with a kettlebell than any other single piece of equipment. I think you can train strength, endurance, cardio. You can train in every plane of motion that we are supposed to move in. And what I think I love most about them is that the kettlebell fits the person versus, like, let's say, sure. a barbell or something like that, where you have to fit the barbell. We're not symmetrical beings. The barbell forces us to be symmetrical. And as a result, what I started seeing in my, my work as a coach is that a lot of people started getting injuries or imbalances, that sort of stuff, because we were sort of shoehorning them into symmetrical kinds of movement. When in actuality, we're not symmetrical beings. We don't move symmetrically through the world. We don't carry symmetrically. We have a dominant hand. We have a dominant foot. We have a dominant eye. And the kettlebell allows us to sort of move in a way that allows us to accommodate the weaker side and build it up rather than shoehorn it into a movement and hope it stays with us through like something like a deadlift where it might end up failing as the stronger side keeps wanting to pull. So kettlebell is pretty much in every commercial gym, but I'll be honest in saying that all the time that I've spent, I haven't seen one person pick up a kettlebell. They always just go straight for the squat rack or the bench. It's a, it's a major bugbear of mine just because I feel like if people really truly understood what that piece of equipment would allow them to do, they would have a better workout in a more efficient time frame and end up being a more resilient person to, to injury and to movement in general. They would have better balance. They would have better muscle engagement and they would be stronger head to toe. I think so often when you watch someone walk into a commercial gym, they are moving inherently toward isolation based exercises um i know you mentioned the squat rack and that's not isolation but they they would they would tend to sort of isolate a body part and train it but what i love about the kettlebell is that sort of every day is a full body day you you can isolate sure you can you can drill down into sort of uh, hitting one muscle at a time if you like but what it does so well is train systemically it trains you from head to toe and as a result it improves your coordination and it improves your systemic strength it gives you that sort of old man strength or farm boy strength you know because everything works together and that's kind of what i think is how we're supposed to move we're supposed to move and be strong with everything moving together i, I don't think there's a, a single scenario in sport or in the real world where we ask our bicep to perform in isolation as an example you know, we, we have to move as yeah. one being, as one as one thing that all works together. And that's what I love about kettlebell training. Obviously, I, I feel like you would disagree. But if someone was to play devil's advocate and be like, well, Glenn, really, you can't train for aesthetics with kettlebells, where the, the isolation movements, you really can target that muscle group. What would you say to something like that? I think um, we can have an open discussion about what is more efficient for developing aesthetics. Sure. And let's make no bones about it. Bodybuilding is best for building aesthetics. And when it comes to bodybuilding, machine work is very, very effective. We can get into the weeds about partial rep ranges and, and half reps and how machines allow you to overload certain reps or certain ranges of a muscle and create better bubbled muscle, all of that sort of stuff. I get it. I've spent 10 years doing that kind of training. But you can create aesthetics with just about any piece of equipment. And so if I can advocate for the kettlebell, the kettlebell is included in that. What's amazing is just that it requires a little bit of knowledge about how to train the body, about how to create meaningful overload, and about how to play to lever lengths. Because if you can create greater disadvantage, which is essentially what bodybuilding is about, we want to disadvantage the muscle maximally, create it a great stretch on the muscle before we shorten it, then you can do that with any implement. It becomes slightly less convenient, maybe with a kettlebell doing something like a curl instead of using a, a dumbbell, but it can be done. 
and what I love doing with so much of my programming for people is taking them through the sort of fundamentals of kettlebell training, whether that's, you know, swing, clean, snatch, Turkish get up, that sort of stuff, and improving the way that they operate as a human being. How strong are you head to toe systemically? But then in the second phase of their training, it could, could be split in a day. So the first phase of the workout is dedicated to skill or strength acquisition. And the second phase of that training can be dedicated to accessory lifts, which can be inclined towards hypertrophy. And if you create hypertrophy in the right way, you get aesthetics. And I guess aesthetics comes down to the sport you're training for. The aesthetic of a cyclist looks different to the aesthetic of someone who wants to walk down the beach with a six pack and bubbled shoulders and all the rest of it, but you can do it. And um, I think most of my clients are testament to that. And uh, if I can use myself as well, I haven't had a gym membership in coming up four years now. So you can definitely maintain aesthetics with kettlebell at the very least. What I really like about your videos that you put out, is just you and Matt, two kettlebells in your garden. It's so simple. And I often feel that people put up so many barriers as in, oh, I don't have a gym membership, I don't have the right equipment, etc. And then you're just swinging these two massive kettlebells around on the grass in your garden. Right. I mean, it's one of the simplest things, the things that I love most about it is because I feel like when you look at social media in general, image offered by so many is that you need to be in the perfect clothes in the perfect environment in the perfect gym with the most amount of time and everything needs to be lined up perfectly great lighting all the rest of it but i feel like i, live, <laughs> I feel like i live in the real world in that i'm a, a, a husband i'm a father of two i run a, a business i squeeze in workouts where i have the time and yeah, sometimes it's in my garden and sometimes it's in, it's in here. It's in my living room with my son watching TV or playing with his toys in the background. Because when you understand training, let's put kettlebells aside, understand training, you can understand how to create overload, whether it is for your cardiovascular system or for your muscles or for explosive power. You can do that in a meaningful way, regardless of the space and the piece of equipment. And when you have a couple of kettlebells and a little bit of information, you essentially have a full gym. You can get after it in 15 minutes, 30 minutes or two hours with a kettlebell in a very small space. You know, over the years, I've been challenged by many clients as they've had things happening in their homes or in their gyms to come up with ways to train in smaller and smaller amounts of space. And ultimately, all you really need is the exact amount of space that a yoga mat takes up and one kettlebell to get one of the best workouts you can imagine in less than 30 minutes. And that's kind of what I think is so amazing about that kettlebell is that it's, it's giving everyone the opportunity to stay consistent with what we know is so important, building strength and staying fit without being able to lean on the excuses of commute times to and from a gym or the cost of a gym membership, which these days, I feel like the industry is split, right? You can either go very, very cheap budget gym where you're going to be waiting for equipment all the time because everyone's there after work or before work, or you go very, very expensive, you know, 100 to 500 pounds a month for a gym where you may still be waiting for equipment. You still have the commute to and from the gym and all the excuses that go along with it. Whereas when I finish my 12 hours a day work job, I can, I can come home pull a kettlebell out the corner of the room and immediately start a workout that will be finished 25 minutes later, me in a soaked t-shirt and burning muscles, 25 minutes, and I've sort of brought fitness in a fun way into the house to not ram it down the throats of my children, but to show them that it's part of your life and it can be fun. You mentioned 25 minutes for a workout and a lot of the workouts you put out online are quite short. Is it the fact that with the kettlebell you need to do less time because it's more intense or is that you just saying that you don't need hours upon hours to get a really good workout in i mean it's six of one joe like uh, on the one hand you can say i'm going to spend five minutes going through like a dynamic mobility routine that promotes better range of motion then i'm going to spend the next 20 minutes doing an emom that explores that range of motion and builds strength throughout that range of motion and at the end of that 25 minutes, you've warmed up thoroughly with purpose, you've trained thoroughly with purpose, and you're done. So on the one hand, I want to show people the barrier to entry for exercise is really low. 
It's a low time requirement and it's a low skill requirement, especially if you find the right people that can guide you through it. I think that the skill you build with a kettlebell, the kettlebell is kind of like, in my opinion, the martial art of weightlifting because you need to learn this skill as you go. So the more skills you develop with the kettlebell, the greater your vocabulary for movement becomes and the, the, the more complex uh, you can uh, make your workouts. Your workouts can be very short and efficient. There is plenty of things in blog articles and magazines saying that because kettlebells engages more muscles, it burns more calories. That's really like the last thing I'm interested in in a workout is calorie output. I couldn't care less. It's it's such a a small element of of it's not even an element of why I train. It's certainly not part of the conversation for why my clients train. It's not about calories. It's about getting stronger and being fit, improving balance, being a, a, an 80 year old that moves well, you know, training as a 30 year old to be an 80 year old that moves well. You can train for two hours with kettlebells, as sometimes I do on the weekend when I get when I'm given more time. But what's amazing is that it's not like walking into a gym and having to move around this large space with lots of different pieces of equipment, hoping that the thing you want is going to be free, trying to stay warm in order to do your three sets of 10. That it's it's just a different way of looking at exercise. You know, like I said, five minute warm up and then you can get after a full body kind of, let's say an EMOM structure because it creates that rep density where otherwise you might end up scrolling on your phone or doing something else and getting distracted. You're ruled by the clock. Every minute on the minute you're gonna be doing something, whether it's a squ swing squat or a snatch thruster, or whatever. And you can really take care of your overall health, well being, mobility balance, coordination, all of that stuff, and know that at the end of 25 minutes, you can put a big check mark in that box as like, job done thoroughly here. This wasn't just three sets of 10 of bicep curls or three sets of 10 goblet squats or whatever. You, you really pushed hard in that amount of time. And I, I, I'm yet to find someone who can't find that amount of time in a day. And for those that can't, I've even put workouts out there that are 12 minutes long and again you've got sort of a structure of three minute imam three minute imam three minute imam three minutes so you're changing the structure every four minutes every every three minutes sorry and doing four rounds and still having a really good workout and because the kettlebells in the corner of your room that there's there's very little impedance to getting it done so say someone was interested in starting their kettlebell journey, how many different kettlebells do they need to buy? Or is just two sufficient to start with? You could you could have one that's sufficient to start with. Anywhere between a sort of eight and a sixteen kilo kettlebell would be more than enough for most people. What I always find amusing is that when I go into a client's house for the first time, this only happens if it's a man, he'll point to his eight and go, that, that's the weight for my missus. This is my, I'm like, listen, I still, I still use my eights all the time. So like you can get a ton of like life out of every weight selection with a kettlebell is my point there. Whether you, you can't really go wrong, whether you buy an eight, a 12, a 16, a 20. And if you just had one, you would have an incredible tool for training forever. And then as you add to that collection, so your ability to like include new exercises or include new intensities of training will increase. I think to answer your question a little more clearly, I would tend to suggest someone buy three kettlebells to start their collection if they can afford the space and the, and the expense. And those three kettlebells would be a light, a medium and a heavy, whatever that means to you. Because then you have, let's say, the heavy is something you can only really deadlift and swing for a couple reps and maybe do some double hand rows. You've got something that really engages your nervous system that much more. You've got something very light that you can learn and play and sort of be creative with. And you've got something that is a moderate weight that you can do for those higher volume sets, like more like hypertrophy, 8 to 15, 8 to 12 rep ranges. That's going to stress the muscle, but not be a scary weight that's going to stop you from wanting to use it. So if you had those three weights, possibly separated by about eight kilograms in between, or maybe more, that would be a great framework to start. And you would understand I've got a light, a medium and a heavy and how to sort of include them in your training. But it's hard to go wrong, Joe. It's hard to go wrong. People buy 8, 12, 16, and then you've got mismatched pairs or offset kettlebells to train 
you know, an eight and a 12 together. It's called offset training. I do it a lot with myself and my clients. And it's an amazing way to train as well. So it's really hard to go wrong. Kettlebell training seems to be right in the middle of the Venn diagram between functional fitness, also HIT, and also strength training. Yeah, like we've been saying, it, it can do all those things. I think for too long it's been in commercial gyms, but not taught or used correctly in commercial gyms. And I, I can't place the blame here with the the sort of member of the commercial gym. It's not their it's not their job to discover and to learn these things. It's the job of the industry to to educate. And when you go through those spaces, the personal trainers don't know what they're doing with kettlebells. They teach swings and things like that poorly. And as a result of not using kettlebells in any meaningful way in their own training, they're not really using it with clients in any meaningful way either because they're just sort of giving the client uh, equipment variety rather than using a tool that they really know how to use. So it, it creates this gap between like see the exposure seeing this piece of equipment a lot and knowing what it's there for how to use it the gap is massive whereas everyone sort of knows what they can get done with a barbell or what they can get done with a leg press machine that the kettlebell sits in the corner of the gym more often than not it's not a very good like the way it's made isn't very inspiring it's not very good and so it creates an extra barrier to being used very well you know chrome handle vinyl wrapped kettlebells create pulling on your forearm in cleans and slippery <laughs> handles when you're using them. So it's like non-optimal pieces of equipment being taught non-optimally. It's created this like gap where people don't really know what to do with it. And it's a real shame. It's a, it's a huge shame. I think it's one of the greatest tools in the gym. Have you always been a kettlebell enthusiast or is it something you've kind of in your fitness journey you've come across in time? I sort of became obsessed with it about six years ago, but I've done everything. Like I'm, I'm 37. I started training when I was sort of 12, 14, somewhere around there. I started, I was always involved in sports teams at school uh, and sort of tried my hand at everything. But then when I was about 12 to 14, I sort of thought, oh, I'll join my dad. I'll go to the gym. Why not? Let's do that. And the only thing that really caught my fancy was bodybuilding. So I started that. And what I used to do was, as this young kid in gyms, I used to walk around the gym and sort of see the guy with the shoulders that I liked or the quads that I thought were impressive or whatever. And I would ask them to teach me something, like, show me what you do. Can you watch me do it? Can you improve the way I do? And I did that for, I don't know, five, six years at the beginning. So from like 12, 14 years old until I was about 18 to 20 years old, I was just sort of reading you know maxi muscle and men's fitness and all those sorts of things walking around gyms and talking to people who were the only metric i had was bigger than me so if you were bigger than me and had an impressive body part i was like okay let's uh -huh. is impressive i want to build a back like that how did you build such a v taper i want that so i got into bodybuilding initially because that was sort of the way in to exercise i think for, for most guys you sort of want to look a certain way feel strong but look a certain way but i also like i said always played sport always did a martial art so i had this element of like how is my strength affecting the thing that i'm doing on the pitch on the court on the mats whatever and then it's just the gym sort of evolved for me i sort of started getting really into powerlifting and trying to see how strong i could get with the barbell effectively uh, i learned a bunch about olympic lifting but because there was always this element of sport and martial arts, there was always a drive for functional, in inverted commas, because all strength is functional, but functional strength, moving in 360 degrees and going to the ground where bodybuilders never touch the floor, right? That I would always want to know how I could be strong from the floor as well as while standing on it, as well as while hanging above it. I kind of wanted to be strong everywhere. And kettlebells were always sort of on the periphery of my interest and then i guess about 10 years ago i started using them more very badly i'm sure the videos are somewhere on, on like somewhere up online of me doing the <laughs> swings and cleans you've ever seen and uh, i think what what got me into it like wholesale was um i was using it a lot at home but then then just before the pandemic i started using them almost exclusively 
And then the pandemic hit and all the gyms closed. And I was like really well positioned to have no interruption in my training. And so the collection grew. I mean, I'm surrounded by kettlebells now. Definitely, it definitely became something that just made more sense because while I was powerlifting, I felt that it made my body and my joints feel healthier if I coordinated my powerlifting with kettlebells and the sort of rotational based movements that things like windmills or Turkish get ups or any of that sort of stuff offer you rather than being so rigid and stuck in place like a powerlifter. Um, I wanted to sort of move freely. And uh, it, yeah, it's so it, it was it was part big part of my program for a long time. But it, it uh, yeah, the pandemic definitely sealed the, sealed my fate as far as gyms comes. I got rid of my memberships, and that was that. Functional fitness seems to be a common theme here, and you also do martial arts. Is it something that you're doing in order to get something out of, or is it purely an enjoyment point of view? Um, I think it's both. You know, I when I did my uh, back qualification with the McGill method and met uh, Stuart McGill, he said to me, I was uh, in between one of the lectures one day, I was in the gym and I was deadlifting. And he said, that's fine, go ahead and deadlift. But I've seen women deadlift more than you. You're never going to be the strongest guy in the gym. And you should instead, you should instead, which, which made me feel great, by the way. Um, <laughs> and instead... <laughs> He said to me, what you should be doing is aiming to be the most pain-free 80-year-old you could possibly be in your training from today. So prioritizing non-ego lifts, prioritizing things that pushed position over power, pushed technique over over just reps uh, as a total so what i say say to clients all the time is do the exercise not the rep i'm not interested in how many you can do i want to see how well you can do it so yeah functional fitness to an extent has always been like in the forefront for me i don't just want to be able to pose really well with the muscle that i have i want to be able to it sounds really sort of like douchey but like use it really well and what i mean by that is not be inhibited in life when I'm moving through the world with my son, who's four and a half, and might say, Dad, let's roly-poly down this hill, and then let's do cartwheels, and can you jump over? I threw, the ball went over the fence. Can you get, you know, all of that sort of stuff. I want to be like a superhero in his eyes and be like, no, I can leap over that fence, or I'll do cartwheels until the cows come home. I'll roly-poly down this hill and skid. You know, I don't want to ever feel like, I'm, I have fewer options in the world. I want to be mobile and strong enough to make it feel like everything is an option. You know, we live by the Thames. I want to be able to jump in a boat at a moment's notice and row. I want to be able to jump on a bike and cycle. I want to be able to do everything. But vanity is a part of it too, so I want to look a certain way as well. And I want to feel like I'm proud of my physique at the end of it, you know. You mentioned wanting to be the best 80 year old you could be in health span, something that's really kicked off recently, especially with Peter Atier talking about this topic. He advocates the balance between strength training and also zone two training. Do you supplement any of your kettlebell work with cardio? Kettlebell work is my cardio. Now, I don't mean that to sound glib. What I mean is about 18 months ago, I realized that I had only explored although thoroughly i'd only explored kettlebell training down one avenue and that was hard style kettlebell training and so what i did was i sought out one of the best uh kettlebell sport athletes in the world and asked her to become my coach i tend to find that when it comes to martial arts and things like cardio endurance events more often than not women are going to be better coaches because they don't have the the mindset of muscling their way through something from the get-go. They, they kind of approach things like this with an, a, a lower, lesser ego, less of this sort of like sense of, well, if I can't do it, I'll just force myself harder. I'll, they, they, they focus more on technique. They focus more on mindset. They focus more on, on position and breathing and all of that sort of stuff. And so when I've learned Jiu-jitsu, it tends to be actually not from women, but from smaller athletes rather than 120 kilogram muscle bound monsters. I tend to have learned really well from 60 kilogram guys in jiu-jitsu. And the kettlebell sport trainer that I, that I started working with, Svetlana, 
She was the 56 kilogram women's sport kettlebell world champion. And she took me down the road of learning kettlebell sport. And that zone two training, I mean, that's the hardest version of zone two training that I, I've ever done. And I still maintain this part of the program. And bear in mind, by the way, I've done the Tough Mudders. I've done marathons and half, well, half marathons. I've done prudential rides on the bikes, 100-mile rides on the bike. I, I've done other forms of cardio. I've done, you know, I've explored other avenues of cardiovascular training and of movement. And I haven't fallen in love with them. They haven't worked for me in, in a long-term sense. And, and even now, there's no way that I could get on a bike for four hours or do two hours of training or an hour of training. I just don't have that kind of time. But the kettlebell, again, is adept to kettlebell, is, is adept to, to, to cardiovascular training. And I think what's really important is when people get into kettlebell training, to, to get into, let, let's say, hard style and learn it, but then to, to backpedal a little bit and start learning the other way that you can move with kettlebells, which is sport training, which is redefined efficiency, right? If hard style efficiency means straight line power from A to B, produce as much force, move the kettlebell as fast as you can. Kettlebell sport training is about efficiency. How long can I move this, this weight for? Can I maintain a long cycle, uh, you know, swing clean jerk for five, 10, 30 minutes nonstop without putting the kettlebell down? Because then you start getting into muscular endurance, zone two cardiovascular training, again, that can be done from your garden or living room. And what I love about it as well, especially as I get older, is that running seems to a lot of people seem to get hurt when they run and as a as a general rule when i start with someone i tend to tell them you have to earn the right to leave the ground because a lot of people aren't strong enough to catch their falling weight so the first thing we work on is if someone wants to be a runner or start running is their ability to catch their falling weight bilaterally then unilaterally without joint deviations and energy leaks and all of that sort of stuff, because that impacts everything above the joint, whether it be your knee, your hip, your back. So kettlebell sport training allows me to do very, very hard cardio without jeopardizing joints as I fatigue, because I'm never leaving the ground. And bear in mind, I do think explosive training is very important and leaving the ground at a certain point is very important. It's kind of an elixir of youth. But kettlebell sport training allows you to train really hard in cardio and bring yourself to the brink of absolute failure without having to risk your ankles, your knees, your hips, your lower back, any of that sort of stuff. It does take good technique though, but it's an amazing training modality. You have to earn the right to leave the ground. That is so good. Yeah. Well, thanks. I should make a t-shirt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned time. You just don't have the time anymore to you know go for a four hour bike ride. So what is a typical week of training then for you? How many hours are you putting in on these kettlebell sessions? So a typical week of training for me, uh, let's just talk about the training side of things then. So during the week, Monday to Friday, I will probably train three, maybe four of those days. Some of my days off are programmed. Some of them are not programmed because life gets in the way and stuff happens. You know, there's children's appointments and school things and whatever. As a result, on the days that I train during the week, they're normally more constrained workouts. They'll be between 30 minutes, normally they're about 30 minutes long, 30 to 40 minutes long. And I will, these days, dominate the first half of my workout with warming up. I, I want to be mobile. I want to feel like I'm moving well. One of the big memories I have as, uh, from powerlifting was just that I felt like shit for most of the day after my workout. My joints hurt, my back hurt, my knees hurt everything was stiff. I don't want to feel like that. I want to feel, I want to feel young and, and comfortable in my body. So I start my workouts by moving. And then I, I have a big focus at the moment. There's something that I'm working on in my training. So I will de dedicate my, the rest of my session towards, like I said, all of my programming, all of my own training and my clients starts off with your main sets are dedicated towards either skill or strength acquisition. So if you're trying to improve something like your Turkish getup, you're really you're trying to improve your skill at moving that way. 
once you've improved the skill, the strength comes with it because your ability to move through that movement dictates your, your ability to do it with a heavy weight. So skill or strength acquisition. At the end of that, that period, that might be 30 minutes. And if that's all I get from my workout, that's all I get. On the weekend, I've got more time to sort of play, be creative, enjoy my workouts more, and do the accessory lifts that make sense as part of my program. But Monday to Friday, I'm training about three to four times a week, usually 30 to 45 minutes per session. And it's, it's kettlebell, mostly kettlebell hard style with about 15 to 20 minutes of kettlebell sport twice a week in there as well to really jack my heart rate up and do the sort of zone two stuff. You've done a lot of work as a back pain specialist. Is that still the case? I still work as a back pain specialist under the McGill method, uh, although not certified. I've done the courses. I've done all of that stuff, done the exams. And so I work as a back pain specialist with him. I'm just not certified and on his website and all that sort of stuff. But I love I love that work because you get to work with someone who, who might come to you and say, you know, I've, I've seen everyone. I've, I, I have a regular appointment with a, a chiropractor. I see a physio. I've been told now that, uh, you know, I've got nerve damage and I need surgery. And I was doing more searching and you're, you're the last person I found. And then I get to help that person. I get to, to take them from chronic pain to being pain free. And if that's where the journey ends with them, then that's the greatest gift is giving someone pain free movement back and just waking up without not being able to trust their body, not being able to trust a sneeze, which might throw their back out or not being able to trust putting on their shoes, which might throw their back out. You give them not only strategies for movement that safeguard them, but also teach them about their specific pain pathology so that they understand where the weak points were, whether, whether they were in axial loading or lateral shear forces or whatever those weak points were for them so they understand their spine and can then go into training and, and know what is right for them and what is maybe more they should be more cautious of. So a lot of those people might get through my typical client journey is about six hours. They have like an initial consultation for two to three hours and then three to four follow-up sessions. And at the end of that, the people that I've seen have been pain-free and they either then choose to use me as a strength coach because I know their spine, their back, or we shake hands and say goodbye. And I'll get a message from them, you know, eight months later saying, it, I've been doing Pilates or I've been doing yoga or I've been going for a run. And what's great is that I know what I should and shouldn't be doing in these large classes where they say, we're going to go into up dog now. And I think, well, I'm extension. I was extension intolerant. So I'm going to do a slightly regressed version of up dog so that I don't go into extreme spinal extension and possibly aggravate something and continue to work on rebuilding my strength in range of motion in extension as well as flexion and all the rest of it but they understand their backs a little better so that's what i was doing with that and i still see back pain people i absolutely love it to the uninitiated what is the mcgill method when it comes to back pain i think uh it can be best described as a thorough diagnostics process now i'm sure there are mcgill clinicians that'll tell me i'm wrong for calling it that because there's you know, the very popularized McGill Big Three, which are a set of exercises that people would go through to sort of rebuild trunk stability in 360 degrees and understand how to move about the trunk rather than through their trunk, which is a really important thing to understand that your, your trunk, your core is there to stop movement, not create movement. It's there to be a stable point in your torso, in your body so that your limbs can create that movement. So whether you're throwing a punch, kicking a football, swinging a kettlebell, the movement happens about your torso, not through it. And so the McGill method is really something that gives practitioners the understanding of the anatomy of the spine, different pain pathologies and how they, how they um, exhibit themselves, to take someone through a very detailed diagnostic process. It's both uh, interview-based and uh, exam physical examination-based, something called pain provocation tests, which sounds very scary because the last thing someone wants when they're in back pain is to be provoked into pain, but that's a bit of a misnomer. It's not you're like you're provoking someone into pain, but you need to understand if a certain movement, if a certain loading position makes their pain better, worse, or no different. And with a simple sort of decision tree 
that comes out of each one of those tests, you get a sense of what their spine tolerances are, what might be happening anatomically in their back. And at the end of the diagnostic process, and only at the end of the diagnostic process, do I then look at scans and MRIs and other reports, because so often those can be red herrings. What I've said to clients that ask me why, they, why I don't want to see their MRI first is, is because if, if you were an alien and I showed you a picture of me that someone took when I jumped off a wall, you would see me in midair and possibly assume I can fly, because that's just a snapshot in time. And it actually doesn't show what's happening to the spine in to the body in motion, or if we can refer it back to the spine, to the spine in motion. So the MRI is a snapshot in time. And what's more important is understanding what happens when the spine is in motion, because that's how it is 99% of the time. It's in motion. What happens when it is under load and how it creates tension to keep the, the, the processes of the spine safe and the body safe. So those things are more important than just looking at an MRI. And the other thing is an MRI may actually be showing you old injuries that still show up. So again, if you, if you looked at a picture of someone with a big scar on their arm that didn't quite understand what you were seeing, you might think that was a horrible cut and like an imminent injury instead of an old scar. So that's, it's really important that, that the MRI informs, backward informs the diagnostic process rather than informs it before you start. What are the most common causes of back pain that you've seen through all of your patients that can be avoided through deliberate process? Hmm. Well, wow, that's a tough question because they've been very, very varied. And something as simple as like the positions we habitually fall into can be the making or breaking of a healthy spine. You know, picking your kids up the wrong way over and over and over again throughout the day and then and then deciding to go to the gym and do a deadlift not understanding that what you've been doing is creating like sheer forces throughout the day by lifting your kids with a rounded spine and then you're about to go and test that in the gym by putting a, a heavy barbell in front of you and try and lift it just understanding the stress tolerances of your back is quite simply i think one of one of the main things that lead people to getting into pain Obviously, if we can take out traumatic injury, because that is such like an obvious one that like if you get into a car crash, if you get knocked off your bike, if you if you fall off your skateboard and whack your tailbone, there's, there's going to be certain traumatic events that create back pain. The things that I've seen repeatedly cause back pain is, is, is lack of movement in general. When I tell people at a dinner party, I'm a back specialist or whatever, that they'll, that you see, you watch them then watching your posture and you think they'll even say sometimes that's not good posture, is it? The way you're sitting. That's not perfect. That's not perfectly upright posture. And what I, what I tend to say to people is that any, any position maintained is a stress p position. Any position maintained is a stress position. So whether you have a perfectly upright torso, and you think this is perfect posture, after a while, you have to move because it's you're know, loading muscles in one position, it's going to become stressful. And if you can extrapolate that out on that thought experiment along that, that sort of spectrum, is if you have someone habitually in a same position at their work desk, let's say you're at your work desk, then you go home on your phone, and then you go home to your TV, and then you might read a book. Every single position has you in this like hunched, slightly stressed, rounded shoulder, flexed lower spine. It, it's overloading that one position throughout the period of 24 hours. And then you, you sort of match that up with improper training or training that exacerbates those positions. Like for men doing too much front loaded work, chest pressing when they're already very front loaded rather than opening up their posture and focusing on spinal articulations. It's essentially held positions, held postures that are never remobilized, re reengaged through the full range of motion without load. Because what people will do is add load. The moment they decide they're exercising, they're going to grab a weight. But like I said to you earlier, the way I start training for a massive chunk of my workout is dynamic mobility. No weight involved moving my joints through full range of motion that includes my spine and doing spinal waves and cat camels and all that sort of stuff 
so that I sort of improve the way synovial fluid moves through the joints and don't accumulate one point in my body where I've just pointed all the stress, all the tension in that one, one area. So I think what people end up with back pain as a result of is lack of movement and then improper training that stresses the same places. Obviously, I don't want to get any back pain. So what would then you prescribe for me when it comes to preventing that? Would it be more dynamic movement or are there certain exercises I can do with a kettlebell, for example, that would preemptively stop any back pain? Well, I don't think there's ever a reason why people shouldn't be doing the big three. Unless you are a back pained person that has been guided away from certain elements of the McGill big three. If, like you've just asked, you're not in back pain, how do I make sure that I don't get into back pain? Look at the way that the McGill Big Three is taught and, and used as an exercise. Look at the way Brian Carroll teaches it. Look at the way that Joel Proskowitz teaches it. Look at the way that Stuart McGill teaches it. And look at it a thousand times, every single time, looking for new detail on their coaching. Because I promise you, there's more detail you haven't seen. It's going to teach you how to create neutral spine because what most people think is neutral spine is actually lumbar extension and understand how to create movement around that neutral spine and then create strength through your entire trunk as a result of those three positions if you were to include those three positions and the pursuit of perfection of those positions as well as pro progression but perfection of those positions you would be training your trunk and the limbs around it to move correctly in coordination and in so creating just a bit of framework to look after your back. But then the other things is removing unnecessary stress forces from your day. So it's not that I want people to think of their spines as fragile. Spines aren't fragile and you shouldn't think of them that way. I'm not scaremongering here in any way, shape or form. But as a thought experiment, if you were to pick up a 30 kilogram dumbbell off the floor would you do that with a rolled spine and and pick it up with poor form or would you do that if you were let's say in the gym by creating a neutral spine putting your knee on the floor bringing it to you and standing using your legs that old hr conversation of if your if your workers have to lift boxes teach them how to do it with their legs right you need people to lift with good form regardless of the thing they're lifting but unfortunately when people move out of the gym that thought disappears so when they lift their their school bag their children their groceries they do it with the worst form you've ever seen because they're not thinking about it being a load on the spine and the same goes for putting on your shoes it sounds simple but you know that movement people do where they put two fingers in the back of their shoe put their toes in and kick their heels down from behind them. It's like an extension twist. It's like the family guy version of a joke way to lift something. It's so bad. It's, it's a joke, like create extension and rotation and then try and lift. Well, what you're doing by kicking your foot into your shoe like that is creating a lot of spinal stress forces. And if instead you put your foot on a chair or the bottom two steps and, and knelt your way towards your shoe, and kept your spine neutral all you're doing is removing the extra stresses from your back so that when in a moment of surprise or in a moment of planned training you need the resilience in your back to be there it's still there if i can offer a, a, an analogy it's not mine um joel proskowitz one of uh, uh, mcgill's uh, master clinicians based here in london when i learned from him he said imagine you're running around a video game and in this video game, you've got a life bar, like in every video game, and it goes from green down to red. But because this is real life, you can't see your life bar. Okay? You're running around this video game, and in this video game, you can do it in two ways. You can run around and shoot all the bad guys and never take cover. You can be taking shots, but shooting them the whole time, make your way to the end of the level. You don't know it, but your life bar is down to red. You, your, your avatar in the video game still moves and jumps and runs and shoots the same way he did at the beginning of that level. But his life bar is down to red. The next level is the boss. And all the boss does is nudge your character once and he dies because his life bar was at zero or at red. 
if instead we went back to that same level and you ran around, took cover, picked your shots carefully, killed all the people in that level and got to the end of that level and you'd only taken a couple shots or none at all and your life bar was still at green. When you get to the next level and it is boss level time, let's call that boss level deadlift day in the gym. You can lift that weight a bunch of times and have slightly imperfect form or push yourself slightly harder than perhaps you should. And that will be the thing that knocks your life bar down but doesn't create an injury. Then you move away back into your life moving well. Your life bar replenishes back up to green, recovery, muscle regrowth, etc., hypertrophy, whatever. But never going below that red part of your life bar because you treat your back well. So maintaining that resilience in your back by making these little decisions correctly. And initially it feels like you're moving around like a little bit of a robot, but it's not robotic. It's intentional. So the way if you've got a low oven, if you're picking something out of the oven, it's not a a twist over bend off to the side one arm. You might want to squat down or just tip from the hip with a decent position and posture. It's not that you can never move with a rolled spine again. It's just understanding that actually some things are going to have a negative impact on your back. And that doesn't mean you get injured. It just means that when you step off the curb funny later and your back goes and you think it's the curb, it's not that. It's that you've been treating your spine poorly for God knows how long. And if you treated it well, then the stepping off the curb funny, your child jumping off the the climbing frame and you having to catch them at a funny angle, the deadlift that goes wrong, those things don't create injury because your spine is resilient. That makes so much sense. Is it anything to do with back pain correlated to why you wear minimalist shoes? Or is that just because you prefer to train in them? Uh, it's both. It's to, it's, it, it is to do with that in that like most shoes are unstable. It's like standing, trying to do a workout on like a, a small pillow. And if I told you to take your shoes off, and then put a small pillow underneath you and told you to be really stable and squat heavy, intuitively, you're kind of like, that doesn't make sense. But that's what most, <laughs> what most ASICs or Nikes or whatever, that's what they, they have a spongy sole. And because we don't place our weight evenly through a foot, through the shoe, it's unstable, it creates this like rocky surface for you to, to move on. And so many, many years ago, I read the book Born to Run. And as a result, bought my first pair of uh, Vibrams, the one, those like toe shoes. And I walked around in them for years and then moved over to Vivos when I read more research saying that something in between your toes is not great for proprioception because, again, you're not supposed to have something in between your toes all the time. And so I moved to just a wider toe box shoe. And A, it creates better nervous system engagement. And you can only be strong if your nervous system is well wired. And if my nervous system is connected thoroughly to the floor, then I can feel what I'm doing. I can feel where I should place my balance, how I can get strong, how I can build tension. And again, like I say to my clients, you, can't, you cannot press heavy unless you build a strong foundation. Everything underneath that weight has to be rigid. So if your feet are rocky, that's the first thing that's going to undermine that rigid foundation. The other thing is that most shoes, because of the rocking and rolling, because it's unstable and it places your, your heels higher than your toes, you're naturally always slightly in spinal extension or encouraged into a lazy pelvic tilt because you're slightly uh-huh. you're slightly heels raised. It's going to slightly pitch your, your, your pelvis forward into that tilt. And if you're not holding your trunk, which you shouldn't be holding your core and trunk all day because that's exhausting and like any position maintained is a stress position. If you're in that position where a a good posture is only maintained with a little bit of tension, then you're naturally going to relax that during the day and move into spinal extension. And then you start getting little bits of like niggly pain through your lower back because when you're standing around waiting for the train, you'll let your belly button drop forward and your, your chest point up a little bit because your shoes are slightly inclined. And so your hips go to that position and everything above it relaxes. And so now, now you're resting on your bones and not your muscles. So part of it is just... Oh, yeah, wow. Just, I did not know. It's like, it's m- mainly, should I just say disclaimer, mainly my opinion, okay? <laughs> Let me just say that very clearly before I get right <laughs> to the calls by someone who goes, well, the research says. So like, actually, that's been my, my, <laughs> my personal experience and my opinion, and that doesn't happen across the board. If you need orthotics, 
ignore me. If you have a specific Morton's neuroma in your foot or whatever, ignore me. That's what has worked for me. It does not work for my wife. It would wreck her if she walked around in barefoot shoes. But for me, it means that I, my feet are stronger. The joint alignment above my feet from everything from foot and up is better. My lifting is improved. I have barefoot winter walking boots, barefoot training shoes. It's pretty much the only thing I wear. <laughs> barefoot winter walking boots. Yeah, look, <laughs> Evo, Evo barefoot make, make walking boots that are like, they're the best shoe I've ever bought. They are, uh, they keep my feet warm, but they're still barefoot, give you good grip. I live near Richmond Park, so I go for long walks with my wife there, and I just put those on, and I can still be barefoot. And just lastly, you talk about consistency being a superpower. What yeah. is it that you mean by that? I mean, uh, I think that one speaks for itself. I, that consistency over intensity, consistency over reps, consistency over everything. I don't care what it is. If it's a bad habit, your consistent bad habit showing up at the, the you know, that the postures maintained for many years will net you an injury. Consistent good postures will net you better position better training frequency. If you can train more often rather than less often at a lower intensity for less amount of time and never be sore, but always be moving, you're going to be better off. Um, I've definitely done the sort of uh, heavy lifting one rep max phase of my life. That doesn't breed consistency. It breaks a body down and the risk is high. What I try and harp on about with, with my clients, with my followers, with all of that is it, it works way better if you can show up four to five times a week and make your recovery meaningful on the other days, whether it's going for a walk, prioritizing sleep, doing a bit of yoga, whatever it is, make your recovery meaningful. Don't just sit on the couch. That's not recovery. That's lazy. If you can, if you can be consistent with showing up and moving in a way that you enjoy, because if you enjoy it, you'll do it regularly. Moving in a way that engages your mind, because if you keep your mind and your nervous system active, then you don't lose the movement capabilities. And moving in a way that challenges you but doesn't break you, then you'll get stronger as well. Keep showing up. It's so much more important than trying to outlift the person next to you or the person on Instagram that you've seen lift more than you thought you could or whatever. That's not important. Just show up. Do 20 minutes, five-minute warm-up, 20-minute email at a moderate weight, four to five days a week. That's the magic number for me is four to five days a week because that is the majority. Whereas if you slip to three days a week, it's just one day's difference. But now that is the minority of your time, not the majority. Of all the fitness people who I've spoken to and also read as well, it's probably the most accessible, most sustainable way for the normal person with a normal life which is busy all the time to consistently train and feel good about themselves. Well, that's what I love about it. Is that like, look, I, I have been fortunate enough to work with some professional athletes in a number of different sports, but that is not most people. They are such extreme outliers that it doesn't, it, there's no point in me talking about training as if I'm training them. It's not important. Their training has got, nothing to do with you or me or the next person who's listening. And even when it comes to them, the sustainable approach is better. They just operate at a higher level of RPMs. That's it. it, it sustainable approach is better. You know, even when it comes to like improving a skill, when it comes to improving a skill, even if it's not getting stronger, the more touch points, the more data you can accumulate, the faster you will improve. And so, so often on one of my recovery days, if I know that I'm working on, when I was working in specifically kettlebell sport, if I'm working on just the sport snatch, I will grab 12 kilograms and do 300 reps of a sport snatch. And that is it. That's my recovery. That's all I'm doing. Now that might sound like a lot. I'm not telling most people to do 300 reps. I've been training with kettlebells for a very long time and training in general for over 20 <laughs> years. For me, that is recovery. I feel no, no impact from that workout whatsoever. It's just that I've been able to move and collect 150 data points on each hand for how to do the kettlebell snatch so that when I next come to it in training, I've got 150 data points on each hand, more information to deal with. And that's, that's what consistency is. That's 10,000 hours to become an expert. It's consistency. You can't do it in a day. 
Words to live by. Right. Glenn Weinstein, thank you so much for coming on the show. You have been terrific. And uh, I suspect there might be a spike in kettlebell sales on Amazon coming very soon. Cool. Well, check out Bulldog Gear. I don't know, don't work with them, but they've been who I've been buying kettlebells from. and They're really good. It's hard to find good quality ones. And they make good quality competition and good quality cast iron. And if people want to check you out, having heard all about the kettlebell stuff, where's best place to find you? I think the best place, the place where I'm most active is Instagram. It's the KB6 on Instagram. And when it comes to those short workouts, there's so much, whether it's on my YouTube, there's a link in my Instagram link tree to my YouTube as well. I've got a ton of free workouts there. It's in a playlist called free programs. Couldn't make it any simpler. They're, they're broken down, <laughs> that they're really easy to get through. You don't have to know how to do a bent press and bottoms up training and complicated stuff. It's simple, low barrier to entry workouts. I have a course as well, which teaches people how to use kettlebells. And then using those lessons takes them through 30 minute long workouts. I practice what I preach, Joe. I really try and put out the stuff that is 25 to 30 minutes per workout. There's no excuse. And that course is beginner, moderate, intermediate, and advanced. So as you go, the point isn't in the advanced level to try and make you vomit. That's not it. It's not advanced uh, cardiovascular range. It's advanced movement options. So you might be doing things like bent presses in the advanced range, but I've taught you how by then. And in the beginner, you'll go swing, clean, squat, press. And then the next one, you might learn a snatch and so on. So you begin to learn how to use your kettlebell. And at every stage, you will employ that lesson in a workout to actually engage with that lesson straight away. And uh, it's simple, 30 minutes per workout. But the easiest way to find me is on Instagram, the KB6, and all my links are in my link tree for free workouts, programming, YouTube, all that sort of stuff. Amazing. Well, Glenn, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Joe.